variety of licenses are available, including commercial, service, and industrial. Perhaps the jewel in the crown is Hamria Port, a center for export and re-export to global markets that handles a variety of cargo and containers every hour of every day. We are proud to have some of the foremost global, regional, and local organizations as part of our business community. Steel industry giants Ever Sunday and Balali, oil and gas industry giants Lamprell and Seco, artisan food manufacturer Italian Dairy Products, marine industry leaders Damin and Al Islami Food Packaging, producers of the highest quality halal food packaging, to name just a few. Uh, we are obviously at Lampro. We have been very pleased with the support that we've had from the Hamria Free Zone. They provide a very flexible uh, support for us um, and have been very important to our growth and development as we've moved forward with the business. So in general it was quite easy and quite uh, encouraging actually for us to set up uh, the manufacturing and the company actually here and even to further expand it as when we demanded further land for our expansions and they were very fast in allocating additional land for us which we are very grateful and thankful and this will allow us now to expand even further and to grow more within the Hamri of Rizom group in general. Here there is a one very good example in terms of efficiency. They speed up quickly when you ask something and this kind of spirit of collaboration is really good for every facility. We consider this one excellent area in terms of ability and facility too. Setting up your business with Hamria Frizo is as easy as one, two, three. Step one, complete an application form at our sales counter. Our friendly professional team take care of the rest. Step two, submit the necessary documentation and fees. Step three, collect your trade license. The entire process takes no more than an hour and is stress-free and hassle-free. For more information and to find out how we can help your business, visit www.hfza.ae. Hamria Free Zone, your gateway to global business. transfer
and the award goes to Supermarkets and department stores where the world comes to shop. Just feel like you. Jump, 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 jump,
I'm not the star. She is. My bridal diamond from Malabar Gold and Diamonds. Be a star. Nothing less. Edition. Luxury in every detail. of my presentation it's going to be really interactive you're going to walk away with a quick clearly defined goal you're going to walk away understanding what you need to do next and more importantly I'm going to make sure that if you're going to make progress you need to know what you do the first hour the first day the first week and the first month after leaving your conference if you want to check me out you can visit my website uh, it's keithabraham.com but to give you a quick thumbnail uh, experience. I've been presenting around the globe for the last 20 years. I've spoken to more than 1.5 million people in 23 different countries. So I've had this great opportunity to look inside businesses and work with leaders. I look forward to seeing you at your conference. Thanks very much for taking the time to watch this video. Bye now. One hour isn't enough time to create steel, but it's more than enough time to create your steel business. And although one hour won't allow you to find oil, it will allow you to find the perfect home for your oil and gas company. In business, speed is critical. And in today's world where everything moves so rapidly, you have to stay one step ahead of your competitors. At Hamria Free Zone, you can set up your business and receive your trade license in just one hour. By streamlining the entire process from A to Z, all you need to do is submit the relevant documentation and let our expert team take care of the formalities. It all started in 1995 with the Free Zone looking after a handful of companies. 
But fast forward to 2016, and we now accommodate more than 6,500 businesses across 22 square kilometers and provide more than 15 key business services and facilities on site. Sharjah is the only emirate with ports on the coasts of both the Arabian Gulf and Arabian Sea, providing excellent shipping links to all corners of the globe. And with the 180,000 square meter Sharjah Island Container Depot, strategically located close by, you also have direct access to key highways and other industrial areas across the country. Additionally, you have convenient access to 230 global cities via the city's bustling international airports. As the cultural capital of the UAE, Sharjah is unique among the seven emirates, home to the largest number of educational institutes in the country with vibrant communities and a rich heritage. The city also has highly developed infrastructure and telecommunication systems, reliable and inexpensive energy, lower labor costs, and affordable housing. And just 20 minutes from Dubai, your business is strategically positioned in the heart of the United Arab Emirates, with an extensive road network to major cities across the country. As your gateway to a host of international markets, you receive a number of direct benefits, such as foreign ownership, tax exemption, no commercial levies, the ability to transfer capital to your home country, and renewable long-term leases. Foreign ownership permitted, no import or export tax, no corporation or income tax, exemption from commercial levies, repatriation of capital and profits, renewable 25-year leases. In addition, round-the-clock security and CCTV banking facilities, a range of business services such as accountancy and currency exchange. Conference rooms and staff accommodation are just some of the invaluable support services that facilitate day-to-day -day operations of your business. With its world-class facilities, warehouses, factories, office units, and investor-oriented management, Hambria Free Zone is currently home to 6,500 companies from 155 countries. A variety of licenses are available, including commercial, service, and industrial. Perhaps the jewel in the crown is Hamria Port, a center for export and re-export to global markets that handles a variety of cargo and containers every hour of every day. We are proud to have some of the foremost global, regional, and local organizations as part of our business community. Steel industry giants Ever Sunday and Balali, oil and gas industry giants Lamprell and Secco, artisan food manufacturer Italian Dairy Products, marine industry leaders Damen and Al Islami Food Packaging, producers of the highest quality halal food packaging, to name just a few. Uh, we are, obviously at Lampro, we have been very pleased with the support that we've had from the Hamria Free Zone. They provide a very flexible uh, support for us um, and have been very important to our growth and development as we've moved forward with the business. So in general, it was quite easy and quite uh, encouraging actually for us to set up uh, the manufacturing and the company actually here and even to further expand it as when we demanded further land for our expansions and they were very fast in allocating additional land for us which we are very grateful and thankful and this will allow us now to expand even further and to grow more within the Hamri of Rizong group in general. Here there is a one very good example in terms of efficiency. They speed up quickly when you ask something and this kind of spirit of collaboration is uh, really good for uh, every uh, facility. We uh, consider this one excellent uh, area in terms of uh, ability and facility too. Setting up your business with Hamria Frizo is as easy as one, two, three. Step one, complete an application form at our sales counter. Our friendly professional team take care of the rest. Step two, submit the necessary documentation and fees. Step three, Collect your trade license. The entire process takes no more than an hour and is stress-free and hassle-free. 
For more information and to find out how we can help your business, visit www.hfza.ae. Hamria Free Zone, your gateway to global business. And the award goes to
Supermarkets and department stores where the world comes to shop. Just feel like you're
Hurry Body at the Chartered Institute of Accountants of India. Keith Abraham's my name. I'm looking forward to presenting at your conference in April. I'm going to talk a little bit about creating passionate leaders for the future. Here's what I do now after 20 years. Chairman, Baker and McKenzie, Habib Al Mullah, Mr. Christian Saunders, partner Alan and Overy, our Galaxy of Past Chairman, ICA Chairman and ICA Vice Chairman, members of the chapter, my colleagues in the managing committee, invited guests and sponsors, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening and warm welcome to all of you. May I request our chairman, CA Pankaj Mundra, to escort Dr. Habib Al Mullah to the dais, please. I also request Vice Chairman C.A. Naveen Sharma and Treasurer C.A. Mahmood Bangara to escort Mr. Christian Saunders on the dais. I just have one question for all of you. How many of us believe in astrology? Can I have a show of hands? Very good. I'm sure many of you looked at horoscope or Janam Kundli. You know the answer? The answer is very simple, to predict the future. In 1960, Professor Altman gave a formula of predictive analysis of health of a company. The Altman Z-score model was the tool available to gauge the bankruptcy of an organization. With this model, people have been successful in predicting financial failures at least more than 80% of the time, and that too before they happened. However, these are the steps which an entity takes before it becomes bankrupt. But what is the solution once the bankruptcy has been identified? As you know, financial hardship affects people from all walks of life. The lack of modern comprehensive bankruptcy law has long been cited as a major shortfall of a U.S. business climate. However, the new bankruptcy law which is a welcome step by the UAE government, provides for the first time a comprehensive legal framework to help distressed companies in the UAE to avoid bankruptcy and going into liquidation. To discuss the new law in detail, we have among us two of the most prominent experts to take us through various aspects of the newly enacted law. Ladies and gentlemen, Please put your hands to welcome Dr. Habib Al Mullah and Mr. Christian Sandra. <laughs> By the way, there are benefits also for declaring bankruptcy. Do you have an idea which is the recent, one of the most recent and one of the most biggest benefits? The President of the United States of America, Donald Trump. He declared four times bankruptcy and now is the President of the United States of America. <laughs> Before I conclude, I will mention about special contribution for our program. I would like to thank C.A. Raju Bora for connecting us to Dr. Habib Al Mullah, one of the speakers for the today's event. A big round of applause for C.A. Raju Bora. <laughs> I would also like to mention the name of our member, C.A. Raghav Prabhu. He is first one to register online for the participation in this event. Is he among the audience? Can you please come here and collect your gift? There is a special gift for you. <laughs> Once again, I would like to thank all our members for their gracious presence and special thanks to all our sponsors who has continuously supported us. Our principal sponsors, Hamria Free Zone and Sharjah Airport Free Zone, NMC Group and UAE Exchange, principal sponsors, Lulu International Group, Commercial Bank of Dubai, Malabar Gold and Diamonds, and IFCO Group. Our institutional partner, Delhi Private School Group, our branding partner, Adventure, and our media partner, Khalis Time. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, once again. Thanks a lot. I now call upon Chairman C.A. Pankaj Mundra to deliver the Chairman's address.
dear guests members sponsors our valued speakers a very warm good evening i am delighted to welcome you today it is quite wonderful and still astonishing to see 500 plus members for this event on a working day on behalf of icia dubai chapter i welcome to all our esteemed speaker today dr habib al mulla and mr christian sonjes who took our and given their concern just 3 weeks back to come and speak among us sir we all are excited to know about the insights and the interesting features of this new insolvency law and as well as the financial rehabilitation law we all would like to know whom does this law applies have this been tested so far and have anybody have applied for insolvency officially in dubai or uae friends before we start our interesting session please allow me to make some special announcement as our also secretary have mentioned earlier that we are organizing a summit on 11th march saturday at almuj rotana now it's become almuj rora hotel in the afc to celebrate international women day it's a 6 hour summit we have speakers like vinita pali former md of britannia daksha bakshi uh, the international tax practitioner from ketan and company miss anjali bansal who is now former md of tpg and ex uh, consultancy uh, consultant for vacancy we have vanna gandhi who is the founder of british orchid nursery we have ms anuradha vp uh, hr at pepsi and ms varsha shah from india the detailed circular which shall follow uh, follow tomorrow and we hope to see you along with your sponsors in celebration of our 35 year of excellence this year will be organizing 35th annual international conference on 7th and 8th april inspired by the launch of ministry of future by uae government in january 2016 we have selected a very interesting theme future of future we already have got consent of nine speakers which include our icia president sri nilesh vikram si Dr. H. R. Nagwender, Padam Shri from Bangalore, who is the chairman of Vivekananda Ashram, Padam Shri T. N. Manoran, Major D. P. Singh, who lost his leg in Kargil war, who was almost declared dead. He is the first black medal winner. So, in the class of speakers who are confirmed, we hope to see your participation for annual conference. Friends, I am also glad to share that last year in February. We had a 1,800 paid members, and I'm glad to share that this event as of today, we have just touched 2,000 members this evening. As you all know, we have targeted for 2,350-2,350 members. I request all of you to spread word and ask your friends and colleagues to join for annual conference. Once again, thank you for this overwhelming support. We look forward for your continued support for our upcoming event. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Now I would request our uh, Vice Chairman Anil Sharma to please introduce our first speaker of the day, Dr. Habib. He is 
a frequent common commentator on the legislation and economy of the UAE, and is often consulted to draft and advise on federal and emirates labor laws. Dr. Habib focuses his practice on litigation and arbitration. He is the chairman of the board of trustees for the Dubai International Arbitration Center and is chairman of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators UAE Committee. He created the concept of financial free zone in the UAE and was the architect of the legal framework establishing the Dubai International Financial Center, the IFC, the first financial free zone in the UAE. Dr. Habib also served as chairman of the legislative committee of the Dubai Financial Services Authority, DFSA. Dr. Habib has had numerous prominent government positions over the years, including being a member of the UAE Federal, UAE Federal National Council, the Federal Par Parliament of the UAE, member of the Legislative Committee in charge of UAE Federal Legislation, member of the Economic Committee in charge of UAE Fiscal and Economic Policy of the Federation, Director of the Institute of Advanced Legal and Judicial Studies in charge of training judges, and prosecutors in the Emirates of Dubai and chairman of the UAE Jurist Association. He has published many books and articles on the UAE law and economy, including a two part on his life's work titled Life's Harvest, a definitive selection of his writings on the laws, politics, and economy of the UAE over the last 26 years. He is also a regular commentator in the media and prominent speaker at many events and conferences within the UAE and internationally. Dr. Habib holds an LMA in Sharia, a law from the UAE University, a Master of Law from Harvard Law School, and a PhD from the University of Cambridge. He is fluent in Arabic and English. Members and guests, give a big round of applause to Dr. Habib. <laughs> we are the first Dr. Habib a full 
bankruptcy regime since 1993, laid down in the commercial transactions code. Unfortunately, I wouldn't say it has never been used, but to the best of my knowledge, it has been very rarely used. How many in this room, for example, have heard of that bankruptcy regime? I'll come more to the details of this bankruptcy law. What you will notice that, I'll put an example to resemble what has happened. You have a car, it gets old, out of date, so you took it to a workshop, you paint it, get it out, and you say you have a 2016 model car. In reality, that is what has happened. I'm sorry to, to disappoint you, but that's the reality. The old UE insolvency law, which was embedded in the commercial transactions code, was an efficient, I wouldn't say efficient, but a comprehensive law at least of 255 articles. And you will see that the new law has less articles than the previous one. The standard law has less provisions than the old regime. But that regime, and I call it regime because it was part of a law, was rarely used for a number of reasons, including the notorious practice of post-dated checks, criminalizing post-dated checks, which I would in fact call it a weapon of mass destruction. When creditors use that, the whole bankruptcy process is destroyed. And instead of going to the long route of insolvency law. Well, now the UE has UN insolvency law, at least we can claim so. So it is pertinent to assess, to assess this law in comparison to the old regime, to consider the changes that have has been introduced, and to gauge whether it will be more widely used by borrowers or lenders than the previous regime. A semantic provision at the out Said, the use of the word insolvency is used instead of the word bankruptcy because there are certain historical meaning of the word bankruptcy which implies certain criminal aspect. A formalistic precision, secondly, in relation to the size of the new law. Both laws are very comparative in length the old law had 255 articles, as I said, and the new law has 230 articles, and this is the standalone law. The new law is divided into certain sections, seven sections, of which the most voluminous is section four relating to insolvency. So basically, we have interpretation and application, financial restructuring, voluntary arrangement, insolvency, general provisions, penalties, and then the concluding provisions. It is to be noted that this law has removed any reference to the arrangement by the court and to the arrangement by abandonment of assets, both of which existed under the previous regime. In the previous regime, the voluntary arrangement could be launched before or after insolvency proceedings. In the new law, the voluntary arrangement is restricted to the proceedings that take place before insolvency proceedings have been launched, while a restructuring can take place 
after insolvency proceedings have started. So it's a bit more restrictive in this approach. But the problem is that this is confusing, especially as there doesn't seem to be much difference between the two regimes except for the name. So let us take a look at what I would call the legislative bank background. Before the new bankruptcy law, we had part five of the commercial transactions code and the bankruptcy related crimes in article 401 to 407 of the penal code. It, that was how they were uh, divided. The status quo, nothing has changed. Civil transactions code that is still applicable today to natural persons, non-merchant or non-traders. The new bankruptcy law, you have it, stipulates that the commercial transaction law, or at least the section dealing with the bankruptcy, part five is repealed, and the bankrupt-related crimes in the penal code also are repealed. So, to whom does this new law apply? Commercial companies, naturally. Companies which are owned partially or totally by the federal or local government. But there is a catch. Provided the bylaws of these companies refer to the application of the bankruptcy law. Now, and I've said it previously, so I'm not trying to, to, to be ashamed of it, I don't understand why to exclude government-related companies. In fact, some of these companies were the major uh, need, needed, in fact, for bankruptcy. And some of them went into certain form of bankruptcy proceedings. I don't see any logic, any reason to exclude these companies from the bankruptcy proceedings, particularly that they form a major part of the business transactions in the UAE. Individuals, only trade, uh, traders or merchants. The novelty in the law that it applies, I'm sorry, I didn't put this off, to civil partnerships. And that was, or that is something new that was not included in the previous law. Let us now go to some aspects of the law. I will just highlight the main aspect. I mean, the law is a bit detailed, but we need to know about the main elements which relate to it. First of all, what is a financial reorganization? It has a very brief section in the law, while I consider this to be the most important part of the law. And it's ambiguous. I mean, if you read it, you cannot figure out what does the legislator trying to achieve. Now, we need to wait for the cabinet until it provides the bylaws of the laws to understand how this section is going to work. Now, the primary role is to oversee the financial reorganization of regulated financial institutions. Financial restructuring committee will be appointed by the cabinet. That will also prepare a list of organizations and bankruptcy expert and their fees. And that's an area that needs to be done immediately if this law is going to be properly implemented. And of course, to keep a record, of delinquent debtors in breach of the bankruptcy law. Another important part is who can decide to apply to the bankruptcy law?
This is an important aspect and we need to be careful because the law has certain rules that one has to clearly follow. First of all, for the voluntary preventive composition, only debtors, period. Bankruptcy proceeding, including debt restructuring, one or more creditor, provided that the total debt must be at least 100,000, which I think it's, it's not a significant amount. And provided a cure period of 30 business days is granted. Regulators can apply, and of course, public prosecutor in the public interest. That is still not very much clear how the public prosecutor is going to play this role. Let us compare here now the preventive measure versus the debt restructure. First of all, the voluntary preventive composition. There should be first financial difficulties. The test of what is financial difficulties is a negative balance sheet test. Cessation of payment, less than 30 consecutive business days and initiated only, as I said, by the debtor. Bankruptcy proceedings, it's an involuntary process. Negative balance sheet is still the test, and I will come to this test later. Cessation of payment, more than consecutive 30 business days as a result of financial instability. So, what will happen? Trustee prepares a report of viability of the business, if the business is viable and the debtor buys in, it goes to debt restructuring. If the business is not viable, then of course, sale, liquidation of business. So, in brief, the new bankruptcy law works like this. The debtor opting for preventive composition threshold is less than 30, financial, 30 days of financial difficulties. If more than 30 days of financial difficulties and or not paying his debts, debtor and or creditors holding more than 100,000 dirhams of debt or public prosecution may apply for bankruptcy. At this stage, if the debtor wants to opt in, he, c he could go to the debt restructuring route Otherwise, bankruptcy route ending in sale and liquidation of assets. <coughs> now, here is the tricky issue. How to deal with the post-dated checks? That's the main problem which faced the previous regime and is still, to some extent, is a problem here. And unfortunately, I'm sure this is going to be abused by creditors. For a check to lose its criminal aspect, the preventive composition plan or the debt restructuring plan must have been initiated. In the sense, be careful because the terminology here is very critical. It's not enough to apply for it. The mere application does not protect you from being penalized under the penal code if there are checks which go bounce. It has to be granted by the court. And this is, in my opinion, the loophole in the law. And this is where this law, I think, is going to fail because sorry, the overwhelming practice here is to resort to positive checks. The first thing, any creditor, whether it's an institution or individuals, deposit the checks at the police. The minute that happens, the whole bankruptcy structure collapses. Th there will be no need, in fact, for the debtor to continue, neither for the creditor also to continue. I think I have said enough 
negative things. Let me try to find some bright spots. <laughs> the first point is the introduction of Financial Reorganization Committee. The law introduces a framework for an out-of-court financial organization process. Of course, the cabinet has, trusted, uh, has been entrusted with supervising the reorganization of regulated financial institutions and distress. Now, the brevity of this section does not allow an analysis of the effectiveness of the role of this committee. We need to wait for another secondary legislation that will be passed hopefully soon, which will determine the powers and roles of this committee. And the committee is expected, of course, to play a very useful role in the context of an out-of-court process. Second brightest spot, simplification of preventive composition. Before the new law, the preventive composition remained a possible pathway for businesses in district. However, the conditions to, put, to opt out for preventive compositions have been relaxed. The ability to settle 50% of the debt is no longer a condition for the composition plan to go forward, as was previously. Any debt that, that is not in default for more than, is now in default more than 30 business days, or is not in debited financial position may initiate a composition. The provisions of preventive composition appear to be more advantages than those of the previous regime. However, we still need more clarity on the debited financial position and the debtor's assets. As currently defined, it seems that the legislator has opted to apply, as I said, the balance sheet test and not the cash flow test. The balance sheet test is widely used in other jurisdictions, but I'm not sure whether that would be the easiest test to follow here. The second thing is that setting a monetary threshold to initiate bankruptcy. Creditors who receive an amount of 100,000 or more can commence bankruptcy proceedings against the debtor. The previous regime, on the other hand, included a threshold of commencing, did not have any threshold for commencing a bankruptcy proceedings. Another bright spot is that debt restructuring today under the new law is an option. So if bankruptcy proceedings are initiated, debt restructuring is considered and may be opted for. Now, this is still a court supervised process, but that its structuring may be initiated with the debtor's content, the consent if the bankruptcy trustee deems that the debt restructuring will enable a higher recovery compared to the recovery under the normal bankruptcy process entailing the sale of the business. However, the debtor, as I said, must agree to the debt restructuring process. It is also important to note here that the debts do not become automatically due as a result of ordering the commencement of debt restructuring proceedings. And any contractual provision to the contrary shall be null and void. Lending institutions may need to consider the impact of this legal provision on a number of common events of default. You cannot contract out of this. As I said, the crimes for dishonor checks are now suspended, but again, as I said, once that debt restructuring or preventive composition is granted. But at least, okay, it's not the full step, but for the first time in the UE, we have a legislation that deals with the issue of criminalizing bounced checks. Relaxing limitation to seeking new financings. The ability to seek new financing is reinforced. The provisions adopted by the bankruptcy law are more flexible compared to the previous regime. The trustee may request the court to approve seeking new financing, secured or unsecured, necessary for the continuance 
of the debtor's business. Additionally, any approved new financings will rank above the debt of unsecured creditors. More powers are attributed now to the bankruptcy trustees. So trustees are nominated by debtors and have been significantly empowered under the new law. And this hopefully will potentially reduce the court's involvement and lead to a smoother and more efficient process. And the trustee, by the way, can be a corporate entity. So not necessarily needs to be an individual. We have a broader scope of application. So all commercial companies, except those which are incorporated in financial free zones. So companies in the DIFC, companies in Abu Dhabi global market are excluded. However, companies in other free zones fall under the regime. <coughs> Some hot spots, I would call it. First of all, the law is still procedurally heavy. All proceedings to continue to be administered and supervised by courts. And the involvement of the courts is almost on each and every action. The process of filing for bankruptcy has not really materially changed between the old regime and the new law. Courts, experts, trustees, and controllers continue to be heavily involved leading to a long, lengthy process. Enforcement actions by secured creditors is now revisited. So the law confirms that the ranking of secured creditors remains unaffected by the initiation of any of the, of the proceedings under the bankruptcy law. Enforcement action over secured assets prior to the ratification of the composition plan or the debt restructuring plan are permissible if, one, the underlying debts are due, and two, the court approves such enforcement action. And the grounds for rejection of an enforcement are very restrictive. However, Following the ratification of the preventive composition plan or the debt restructuring plan, the trustee becomes entrusted with the sale of assets in line with the restructuring plan. And the sale proceedings must be used first to repay the debts of the secured creditors. If a secured asset is essential to the continuation of the business or the continuance of the business, the court may decide to substitute the secured asset with another unsecured uh, asset without a prejudice to the interest of the secured creditors. If and when the debtor is declared bankrupt, in the sense that the debt restructuring plan is approved or the preventive composition was unsuccessful, all debts become due and the appropriate assets must be sold and the sale proceedings must also be used to repay the secured creditors. If the sale does not take place within one month of the date of the bankruptcy judgment, the secured creditor may request the court to approve the enforcement over the secured assets. Again, one month, certain types of assets may be too short a period. Under the old regime, this is, the situation was a bit different. The old regime stated that all enforcement actions shall be suspended in the context of preventive composition, but not in the context of judicial composition or bankruptcy proceedings. Debtor's liability remains as it is. So directors whose actions have caused losses continue to be jointly liable for the debts of the company if the assets of the debtor are not sufficient to cover 20% of its debts. Suspect period remain as is. So any transaction entered into within two years before the issuance of bankruptcy proceedings, which we call a suspect period, is void or voidable according to the case. 
And finally, on this point, and again, regrettably, it's notable that the previous law was more favorable to the insolvent <coughs> persons in the event that the plan was approved by the required majority. So as such, the plan was enforceable towards everyone, which is the same approach, in fact, which the French law takes. The new law, on the other hand, allows secured creditors to keep their security and ranking as they will be paid in priority from the sales of the secured assets. So, what are the next steps? The law has been issued. What are the next steps? First of all, we need to monitor the issuance of the secondary legislation. This law will, cannot be implemented without the secondary legislation. It's good to have, but it's a tool that it's like you, you, are, you are having something which needs a still a battery. We need the batteries. Businesses anticipating any potential inability to meet their financial In conclusion, I say success will depend on course efficiency and insolvency specialized judiciary, which you don't have yet, secondary legislation awaited, licensing system for insolvency expert, and no out of court system except for financial reorganization. This is a broad approach to the law. We need to wait and see how the courts are going to deal with the different provisions of the law and how the business community is going to react. That will be the test for the success of the law. Thank you. We can have few questions to Dr. Habibal Mullah, if anyone has. Uh, Dr. 
Mr. Mullah, this is a great honor to have you on stage with us. Uh, of course, I know you from uh, you know previous occasions where we have worked together. Now, to see you amongst the Chartered Accountants, I think it's a great honor to have you. And of course, we've heard you speak. Uh, my question to you is that uh, in other countries, like where we have the Chapter 11 in the United States, it's a personal or an individual applying for it to seek protection. Now. I believe that this does not apply to individuals, it applies to corporations. Uh, that's one. Second, I mean, just a clarification. Second is, you said from 30 days, if you are owed like 100,000. So is it from the date when it is overdue? That means, suppose I have an invoice, and the invoice, the collection is, uh, say, 30 days. So after the passing of the 30 days, when it becomes an overdue, and the debt is more than 100,000, the debtor has a right to go for the insolvency. So these two things, first for the individual or the 30 days? Okay. Uh, it does apply to individuals as long as they are deemed traders or merchants, not a civic person. But let me go back to your question about chapter 11. Do we have chapter 11? In my opinion, no. Bankruptcy proceedings or bankruptcy process law, legislations, and other jurisdictions aim to protect businesses that are in distress so that they can survive and continue forward if that is feasible. If you look into the provisions of, of the, the federal law, the theme which uh, shapes the whole law is a criminal aspect. A bank, a company which is in distress, has committed something wrong, has to be penalized. There is a long section, I didn't go into detail, but very long section about the penalties for each and every action. And it seems that the theme of the law is to, to drive it to, or, or the company to impact liquidation rather than protection. It doesn't say so in, in, in these explicit words, but if you look at the theme and the spirit of the law, that is what is it doing. Now the 30 days are still not very clear. I think it's from the date when the debt becomes due. That I would think should be the approach that the court would take. First part, what do you want to do under the first part of your question? First part of question is that... Uh, As an individual, you wanted to... Yeah, there's a company, and company has not paid the wages for last six months. Total amount outstanding is more than 100,000. Okay, now more than 30 days period, more than 100,000 outstanding. Now, as an individual employee or group of employees, can I use this, can I use this particular law to force the company? Theoretically, theoretically, yes. You are a debtor. Okay. There is nothing that prohibits you, that law did not differentiate between commercial and non-commercial debts. Okay, thank yes. you, sir. Uh, good evening. Thank you for the interesting session. I uh, have two questions. One, you were mentioning about the secured asset. Okay, if you can clarify it once more, that if it's a secured asset, and uh, of course somebody is holding that asset, and how is the, it affects the business continuance? And uh, second, you had mentioned that uh, th this law is, uh, will cover transactions done even before two years. The court can have it, uh, avoid, it's a avoidable transaction. 
Yeah, if you can a little enlighten uh, or repeat it a little uh, once we go. Thank you. On the secured assets, what I was saying is that the bankruptcy proceedings or the voluntary composition does not affect the secured assets. So secured creditor, creditors remain secured with their assets. They will have the first option when sale of assets takes place. This two years period is a kind of a protection, in fact, for debtors. So once the preventive composition is granted or the bankruptcy proceeding is granted, the trustees can go back and verify transactions which took place two years before that date. And they have an authority to void it, whether they what is the test? Still, it's not clear. We need to see the practice. Uh, sir, you have explained about the check bonds issue with this uh, liquidation, what happens if client gives us check and it is bounced? Can I still proceed against uh, As I said, the law did not go as far as fully decriminalizing bounce checks. So if you have checks which have bounced and the bankruptcy proceedings have not been yet granted or the com preventive composition has not been yet granted, yes, you can still apply to the public prosecutor or to the police to take criminal action. Now what is not clear is that what happens to the cases which are in the process? So let us assume that you have filed for the uh, criminal action against the bounce check. The police refers the file to the prosecution. The prosecution takes it to the court. I'm talking at the court stage. And while the case is at the court, then before issuing a judgment, the bankruptcy court issues, for example, the preventive composition of the bankruptcy proceedings. I think the court will either suspend the proceedings or they may just uh, quit the claim. They said it's not anymore criminal because the provisions of the bankruptcy law in this aspect prevails over the provisions of the criminal code. Thank you, sir. Thank you for taking the questions and responding to them. Uh, May I request Chairman and Vice Chairman to present a memento to Mr. Abhi Bulmullah? Smriti Mishra to please come on the stage and introduce Mr. Christian Saunders, who is partner with Alan and Overy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my privilege to introduce to you Mr. Christian Saunders. Christian leads Alan and Overy's restructuring practice in the Middle East and is widely recognized in the market and by leading directories like the International Financial Law Review, IFLR, as one of the world's leading banking lawyers. Christian acted on the Global Investment House, Dubai Group, Dubai World, Gulf Finance House, Al Jabbar, 
the investment that KSC is dead, and Nakheel, and Ahmad Hamad al Ghosebi and brothers restructurings in the Middle East. Praise for his intelligence. His clients say he can tackle the most challenging scenarios. The IFLR 1000 2014 said, Christian Saunders is perhaps the cleverest technical lawyer that ANO have. So if you have a really difficult question, you can go to him. Please join me in welcoming Christian Saunders. So there will be some overlap, but hopefully um, I can um, introduce a slightly different angle. I was quite surprised to learn that there was no new law and almost threw my slides away. But I'll give it, I'll give it my best shot to convince you actually some things did happen at the end of last year and perhaps things will happen um, going, going forward. So um, there are two things I'm told that we should be very careful of. First of all, an English man with a cookbook, and secondly, a lawyer with a microphone. Um, I'll try and keep this to approximately an hour or so, uh, but uh, I'm very happy to answer any questions throughout the session or at the end as you, as you see fit. So, you'll see there are two of us up there. Actually, uh, I'm probably going to do most of the initial talking, but I'm here with a colleague of mine, uh, Salam al Smadi. Um, Salam is uh, one of our um, sort of uh, what we call local law experts, because as you can probably tell, uh, I, I'm not Emirati. Um, I don't appear in the courts. Uh, Salam is uh, Jordanian qualified, and if you have any particularly difficult questions, uh, I'd appreciate it if you directed that to those two, uh, to Shalai. Uh, I'm, I'm here just really to introduce uh, a touch of glamour to the, to the proceedings. So let's, let's move then to um, what we'll be talking about this evening. Okay. Um, I should say actually up front uh, that we should have had email to you or available on your website or on your chairs uh, this, this, this fantastic article uh, that some very clever lawyers wrote. Um, if, you, if you feel the need to leave, uh, everything that I'm about to say appears in there in some way, shape or form. So if the coffee is more attractive than listening to me speak, you've got it all there um, anyway. So what will we be talking about uh, this evening? Well, we're going to touch upon some of the old law and some of the problems with it. Uh, uh, the doctor has already kindly picked up on, on some of those, but, but we'll look at that because it's really important to look at the new law, um, although I'm apprehensive calling that, uh, calling it the new law because we've just learned that there isn't one. Um, but um, we need to assess what the new law really does in the context of what the old law did, or, or rather perhaps sort of didn't do in the context of insolvency and bankruptcy. We're going to look at what the new law sort of does, give it a little bit of an overview. We'll look at the four new processes that have been introduced by the new law. We'll look at some of the specific issues that some of the creditors will be looking at, albeit obviously many of you perhaps will be advising debtors in this situation. So it's the flip side, we'll give you some of the, some of the insights that perhaps some of those clever lawyers will be advising their, their creditors. And then we'll look at it at the end in terms of, uh, we'll give it an evaluation. We'll see whether or not it really has moved. They're all prohibited too. For those of you that look at financial transactions that, you know, we loosely call them derivatives, you know, billions and billions of dollars of business in the UAE, trillions across the world, depend on the ability to set off in certain situations. 
Okay, this is absolutely critical. It's not a legal nicety. It's absolutely critical that we can see many a, a financial institution going through all the problems that they are at the moment as a result of changes in, the, in margining. Many of you will be familiar with that in, in Europe, but, that, but that's a totally different matter. Creditor ranking. Creditor ranking, very interesting, because as we all know, as we've established, debt always comes out before equity. Equity should be excluded from a situation, okay, if, if the debt doesn't come out first. But unfortunately, as we've just established, one of the major failings of the, of the previous law was that it, in effect, but not in words, affected value transfer between those two concepts. So, what were the problems? It took forever, it could take years and years, but we don't really know because no one was actually brave enough to actually um, file for bankruptcy. Better get what you can off the table through a consensual arrangement than actually throw yourself on the mercy of the court in this situation. Unsecured creditors could be bound. Creditors could come along and take the guts of a business if they happen to have security over the various assets. That was a major failing. There was a lack of focus on rehabilitation. Okay, what do we mean by rehabilitation? Well, again, if we go back to what we mean by insolvency law, you have the old Victorian ideal of the free flow of capital. If I have a property interest, it is the job of the court, it is the job of the sovereign to recognise my property rights. They are from of the ongoing nature of the business. The corporation effectively as a welfare provider. Yeah? Jobs are absolutely critical, even though that might result in the property rights of a bank being overruled in that situation. Okay? Actually, most jurisdictions are somewhere between the two in, in, in that regard. And many, you know, in many ways, you know, the old sort of property rights, the importance of banks, yeah, has been reinforced, you know, of late in terms of being too big to fail. Banks need the rights to uphold um, their property rights. They need their ability to get that property, to protect that balance sheet, because we'll all be worse off if any of the banks actually uh, go down, on the one hand. And then we have looking after the employees on the other. But that's all kind of blurred nowadays, where you have huge pension pots, if you like, huge pension funds, and pension funds being invested in banks, invested in companies, and therefore it's not the clear banks versus companies kind of dynamic that we have, or we used to have nowadays, and the thing becoming much more blurred, and that being reflected in the laws that we have already. But perhaps most importantly is, is a total lack of clarity in the law. People really didn't know what the law really said, or how it would work. So, what does the new law do? Okay. Well, as, as, as uh, Dr. Um, Amol mentioned, um, there is a new marker in the law, not completed, that looks to the finan uh, providing a framework for the financial rehabilitation of distressed financial institutions. Nobody really knows what this means. The law will seem to suggest that, that it, this is almost like almost to deal with a situation of financial institutions that are too big to fail, okay? They cannot fall within the current confines of the bankruptcy law, yeah? Banks, insurance companies, and so on like that. And so a lot of commentators are saying it's to do, it will be to do with that. Other commentators are saying, well, actually, no, it's to do with an out-of-court sort of framework. But anyway, who knows? We'll, 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 we'll find out. But then we come to the real processes. And, we'll, and as we'll learn, it introduces three other new processes. A light touch rehabilitation regime for solvent but financially distressed entities, and I'll come on to that apparent contradiction in a moment. 
um, a, a rehabilitation regime for an insolvent financially distressed institution, and thirdly, insolvent liquidation. In that context, it introduces what we would hope is a much more workable cram down mechanism. And it, you know, what is absolutely critical is that the legislation imposes very tight timelines on the various players in any workout or any liquidation under the new act, whereby the players, be it the debtor, be it the creditors, be it the insolvency official, and even the court, interestingly enough, for the UAE, are obliged to perform their roles, their allocated roles, within set periods. And therefore, for the first time, we're not in a situation where we're saying, well, an insolvency might take two years, three years, five years, you know, is it going to be Dickensian bleak house all over again? Um, you know, you used to have to say, well, perhaps, whereas actually now, you can actually map out the timeline, a maximum amount of time that any workout should actually take. And that is, you know, not only novel, but very welcome here in the UAE. And as Dr. Uh, Abu Mamala mentioned, there is now a new test for insolvency. It used to be the case that bankruptcy or insolvency was tested simply by reference to, is the relevant person, is the trader, meeting its debts as they fall due? Yeah, like a cash flow test, if you guys would know it. Whereas now we've actually got a second test, which is balance sheet insolvency. Yeah. Do your liabilities exceed your assets at any point in time? Unfortunately, um, to preempt the question that I'm sure this many accountants in the room will come, how do you measure balance sheet insolvency? How do you measure contingent liabilities in that situation? What about an SPV on a developmental financing that's borrowed a whole load of money and has only got half a building? Yeah? Surely that must be balance sheet insolvent, and many people would nod and say, yes, that's absolutely right. Okay? But there's no guidance in the law, actually, as to whether or not you'll take a, a like, you'll look at financial statements, or like under English law, that can be a starting point, but not the be all and end all. So, but there is this new test, and that's, and that's welcome, you know, in, in, in many ways. So, this is what we're ne next going to talk about, those five things. I'm very proud of these slides. <laughs> There's lots of pretty pictures, usually I just do bully one. Okay, so to whom does the law apply? Okay, well we've touched upon uh, much of this in the previous talk, so I won't really spend a huge amount of time going over the same things again, but it's clear that it still applies to traders, that's still in there, so anyone that the old law applied to, still applies to, with the same ambiguity around that. But it's clear that it applies to all UAE companies, okay, and importantly, what it says is UAE companies, including those in free zones, unless the free zones have their own insolvency and bankruptcy laws. So that would exclude the DIFC, it would exclude the ADGM. Small critique, but could be very important to certain situations. It doesn't deal with the situation where we have in some free zones where you've got half an insolvency law. Many of you might be familiar with, say, the DMCC, okay? It's kind of half a rehabilitation regime, and it's not clear whether or not you just look at that, that's displaced by the new law, or you look at that and then you look to the new law to fill the gaps. But what if it's inconsistent and so on? So unfortunately, where you've got the free zone and you look at the regulations, you know, going forward, you want it either to deal with it properly, like it does in the DIFC or the ADGM, or it doesn't deal with it at all. A halfway house is worse than no house at all in this case. Government companies, to the extent to which they have opted in, that's quite interesting in some ways because if you look at the decree, two different types of decree company, you've got like an Abu Dhabi style decree company that effectively says, you, you, here is a company and it will be governed by the, the, the laws of the company's code or, or whatever. And it, it deems it to be part of the federal law fabric. As opposed to a Dubai entity that, his, that historically has been, here's a company and here are one or two things that you need to be aware of it. But there is nothing else in there in the establishing decree that really helps you establish whether or not this um, 
you know, how, how this would apply. So we may see a divergence between Abu Dhabi degree companies and Dubai degree companies in this, in this situation. Civil law, uh, sorry, I should say is civil companies and sole establishments, so that's the partnerships and things like that. So for those of you in private practice, um, welcome to the new law, um, to the extent to which you weren't, weren't traders before. So effectively what this covers is pretty much everybody that is operating within the commercial economy. Now, okay, not just traders, but much, much more. It's hard to disagree with the criticism previously about this not applying to government entities unless they opt in, given the dominance of government entities in the economies of the various Emirates. That is a, that is a shame. And we may see more examples like 357, the bespoke piece of legislation that was passed for the Dubai World Group of, 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 um, of, of companies back in uh, 2009. So, let's come to the first process that wasn't the process that I just mentioned before, which is the framework for financial restructuring. So a preventative composition, it's, it's been called various, it's been translated from the Arabic in, in, in um, with various things, preventative um, composition, protective composition and so on. Um, and I'll go through some of the incidents of this. Just a bit of code, you might notice actually that some of the text is in black and some of the text is in red. Um, just so you're aware of that, um, it, it's simply that the red bits are those that are common to more than one process. Okay? So if you can see on here, say the moratorium being imposed, I'm only going to talk about it here, but it's the same for the others when I come on to it. Just so that you're aware of what the colour coding means. <coughs> and I am limited in my technological abilities, but I can change the colour even to make it deliberate. Okay? <coughs> So as we talked about, this is a financial rehabilitation process for a solvent debtor. Okay? So what we're talking about here is a, um, a debtor that whose who's, who's debts are um, less than 30 days overdue. Okay? If your debts are more than 30 days, or business days, strictly speaking, then this doesn't apply. So what you're looking at here is a situation of a debtor who is fundamentally solvent, but is having is facing some kind of cash squeeze. Okay? And that's important to recognise here because this is very much a light touch. Okay? This is a process that can be started by the debtor alone, so none of its creditors, but that's okay because this entity is fundamentally solvent. Okay? It makes sense in that context. Okay? A moratorium is imposed, and this looks like a moratorium that many of you will be familiar with other jurisdictions. So effectively, any action that you have as a creditor is frozen at that point in time. You are not permitted to pursue that process, even if you started it in the courts, from the time that this composition process starts. That's not the point of filing, as we learned in the previous talk. That is the point that follows the filing when the court accepts the jurisdiction to take this forward. Okay? So there is indeed that gap between filing and when it is accepted. But when it's accepted, a moratorium is imposed. You can no longer pursue the debtor, nor can you enforce your security. Okay? It's solvent... Okay, I keep coming back to that. And therefore, it's fair that the debtor retains management control. Okay. It is continuing to run the business. Okay. This ma that may not sound so surprising in this context, but I emphasise it here because I'm, you might be surprised to learn, I'm going to say the opposite when it comes to the next thing. Okay. So the debtor retains control. He is still operating. Okay. And we learn, and I won't go through it again, there are various reports that get produced by... Um, by, by the debtor, the insolvency of Fisherman and so on, that actually go to what the rehabilitation <laughs> will look like. Okay? Now, this fundamentally is composition, and therefore what we're looking at is the ability, or the debtor is looking for the ability to compromise in some way the rights of its creditors. 
fundamentally, it's unsecured creditors. Okay? And I'll come on to secured creditors in a moment, but we're just talking about the unsecured creditors. And so, we are looking at the debtor asking its uns unsecured creditor body to approve some sort of plan. And that plan, effectively, it will almost invariably involve amendments to their legal rights. Yeah. Now, to amend their rights, you will need to pass both a value test and a numerosity test. So the majority of creditors by number and two-thirds by value will need to vote in favour of the composition that has been put forward to the debtor. There's no limits on what that composition might, in might involve. It can involve a compromise of the debt, reduction in the amount paid, changes to the rate or the, the regularity of payment of interest, removal of interest, um, pushing out the tenors, whatever it might be. That could all be voted on by the unsecured uh, creditor body. And as long as you meet those two tests, majority by number and two thirds by value, the dissenting minority will be bound. Okay? Now many of you will be absolutely familiar with this concept, but this hasn't really happened here in the UAE. So those of you that have kind of grown up here in the UAE in terms of learning the tools of the trade, this will be highly unusual. Okay? But it, obviously it's the way that these things go in many a, many a jurisdiction. We can have, for the first time, what we call dip financing, yeah, debtor in possession financing, that is actually very common in Chapter 11, for those of you that are familiar with that. Okay, it's a concept whereby a debtor that needs liquidity can, with the approval of the court, go off and raise new debt. And that debt will be paid out in priority to the unsecured creditors' claims. Yeah? Now, the court needs to sanction it, and if it's part of the plan, it also needs to be blessed by the unsecured creditor, so perhaps not as effective as it might seem. But the important thing here is that this financing is, is there to provide the lifeline to the business, as many of you will be aware of in this, in this situation. And indeed, in the US, there's, there is an industry in DIP financing, often at a very high yield, although that does rather sit uncomfortably with it coming out ahead of everything else, but, but that, that, is, that is the industry and it performs a very useful task in many situations. That financing can even be provided by you know, many of the unsecured or, or indeed the secured creditors. And it can also be secured. So not only does it rank ahead of the unsecured, it may well be that the creditor providing this financing insists on and obtains, with the blessing of the court, security either security over unencumbered assets, second ranking, security over assets over which security has already been granted, or even, you know, with the blessing of the court, the secured creditor's rights over a particular asset can be moved to a different asset, and you give that security, those assets to the new super priority lender, if I got that right. Okay. So the court has huge discretion to give priority to that, to that creditor. It is limited in time. It's a three-year process, albeit there is a potential to extend by a further three years, so three plus three, okay? Now, it's not entirely clear what's meant by that, but it looks like the plan needs to provide for all the unsecured creditors to, be, to have all of their liabilities extinguished or discharged in accordance with the plan, not necessarily with what they had originally, within three years. But if that doesn't happen, you can go back to court and get an extension. Okay? All of this is fine, of course, because this is a solid letter. Okay? Unfortunately, most of these situations, if they do come before the court, are likely to involve um, insolvent uh, debtors, because solvent debtors don't generally tend to avail themselves of process, uh, these sorts of processes. But you know, perhaps, perhaps we're wrong. So this is an insolvent debtor, so this is a debtor that is balance sheet insolvent, whatever that means, or its debts are more than 30 business days overdue, okay? And therefore, this is mutually exclusive with the protective composition. You can only be in one or the other. If a, if a debtor 
um, files for the protected composition on the basis that it believes that it is solvent, and it turns out that it wasn't, then they can be moved into this process, although that's more of a procedural matter than, than a substantive one. Okay? It can be the restructuring scheme or the restructuring process can be commenced by the debtor, it can be commenced by a creditor, it can also be commenced by the public prosecutor or an interested regulator. The moratorium is imposed, exactly the same as previously. It is insolvent and therefore the law works on the basis that as it is insolvent, the debtor is no longer competent to manage its business. Okay? And therefore the debtor cedes control to a court-appointed process, a court-appointed official. It's called a trustee or it's called lots of different things. But, but we have a court-appointed um, official that effectively will run the business under the supervision of the court. Yeah? Really important point there. It requires the approval of the unsecured creditors. Same test, numerosity and value. Unsecured creditors do not get to vote, but they are also not bound. Okay? It's worth pausing there to say, well, what do we mean by that? Okay? As we learned in the previous talk, a secured creditor to enforce its security once you're within this process has to go to the court to get permission to enforce its security. At one level you might say, well what's new there? For formal security here in the UAE, almost all of it is enforced only with the blessing of the court, a court control auction and so on. And therefore, whether you're going to the court to ask him for one permission or two permissions, it's always going to be the same. However, what's implicit in the law here is that the court will consider the impact of the enforcement of the security in the context of the success of the restructuring scheme. It doesn't say that, but that's what's implicit in the law. Yeah. So, if you're a secured creditor and you don't want to be subject to this consent requirement, what can you do? Well, you can always waive your security. And if you waive your security, indeed you get a vote, because from then on, you're an unsecured creditor. You can do it conditionally as well. So you can vote, you can waive your security, vote, and if the process doesn't get through, you actually get your security back. Okay? Now, hopefully all of you are thinking, why on earth would a secured creditor waive its security in that situation? Okay, and it's a very good question, um, and I'm glad I asked it. The reason for that is that the law assumes that you are fully collateralised. So if you have a debt of 100, it works on the basis that your collateral is worth at least 100. Yeah? So it's not like in many jurisdictions where if you have security of 100, if you have a debt of 100 and your security is worth 20, then you divide your debt in two. And you say, well, I'm secured for 20, and I'm unsecured for 80, and therefore I'll vote my 80. That is not what the law says. Now, it's possible that the court could interpret it in a particular way, but if we look at the historic jurisprudence for similar concepts in other civil law jurisdictions in the region, it would appear that effectively you are either secured or you're not secured. Okay? Such that if your security coverage is so low that actually you think that your recovery will be better and you want to vote by becoming unsecured, then you may choose to waive that security. Because then you can participate as an unsecured creditor to the full extent of your debt rather than being to prejudiced and sitting out there as a secured creditor. So it's a peculiarity of, of the law in the way that it assumes that you're fully collateralised. Yeah. But not unusual if you read many of the other laws, they have that assumption that you are collateralised or you are not collateralised. It's binary. It's not, it's not a shade of grey. Dissenting unsecured creditors are bound, like before, once again, we've got this super priority debt, 
with the court approval. Here, you're insolvent, so the law gives you a bit more time to sort yourself out. You're given five years, plus a potential extension of three years. Okay. But not all businesses can be rehabilitated. Sometimes liquidation is the only way forward. So when do you end up in this situation of liquidation? Well, essentially, it's where either at the start, although there's a little question mark over this, you're just totally wiped out or as good as and there is no chance of rehabilitation. Or in the reporting of the rehabilitation plan, and there's a, there's a large process around that whereby the insolvency official, the debtor, produces a plan that the court reviews and things like that. If that is not convincing, then you move into the liquidation. If that plan gets passed, but it fails, either on a protective composition or a restructuring scheme, you can end up in liquidation. In any of those situations, and more, if the debtor commits a malfeasance of a certain sort, it can get punished, effectively, by moving to liquidation. Now that's not automatic, because obviously it could be, that could really prejudice innocent creditors, but it is a possibility. Yeah? And interesting to see that in the law. Anyone can start this process, and indeed, Insolvent liquidation and the restructuring scheme have a common commencement process. It's almost like you go for you go for both of them, and you'll determine early on which one that you'll go for. Okay, but ultimately, with failure, all roads lead to liquidation. Okay, as I mentioned before, this isn't the only liquidation regime in the um, in the UAE. There is still the liquidation regime in the company's law, albeit by implication. This deals with insolvent liquidation, and the other one, which applies only to companies, not the wider variety of entities that this might apply to. Um, that will apply to companies when it's solvent. Okay? It doesn't say that, but that's the implication, and if it doesn't mean that, then the parts of this law don't really make sense, and it becomes clear that that part of the law and the company's law gets displaced if you're down in, in this situation. Okay? There's a stay on actions, okay? That's different to a moratorium, okay? A moratorium is like a temporary suspension of all those claims, you know, in order to allow the rehabilitation. A stay on action effectively says, okay, it is economically inefficient to allow everybody to pursue this debtor. We're now gonna wind it up, and therefore we'll have this economically efficient process whereby we'll get the assets in and we will distribute them on a pari passi basis or priority basis, as, as many of you will be um, uh, familiar with. There is still, throughout the recognition of preferential claims, as many of you will be aware of. The typical thing, the taxman, the employees, certain rents, things like that, they come out above unsecured creditors. Okay? And once again, as in the case with a restructuring scheme, the management of the company, which is likely to involve the simple uh, controlled liquidation or wind down of the entity, is now ceded to the court appointed official. And you will have seen that we've brought up the court appointed official a number of times here. He's controlling the management, he's also producing the workout plan. He also has other roles in terms of reporting performance against. Um, uh, against the plan that gets passed. And I'll come on to that in a moment because this official is central to the law. Okay? Obviously it's not, it's not one guy, you know, it's a concept, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an office. And I'll come on to that because I think in many ways the success or failure of this legislation is dependent upon this, this I say chap, could be a lady, yeah? but this person, okay, um, is one of the three pillars, or the three legs of the three-legged stool, as it were. You know, absolutely critical. And once again, we have an expedited timeline. Okay? So hopefully gone are the days where um, uh, it can take several years to simply liquidate an entity. I mean, many of you will be familiar with the World Bank's statistics on insolvency and bankruptcies, where you'll have 
figures uh, such as for the UK or Singapore or Hong Kong, where on an insolvency, a creditor on average can expect a recovery of um, somewhere between 70-80% of their, of their claims and a cost of the estate of less than a single percentage point, okay, and expect the whole thing to be wound up within a year. Yeah? It's great for those places, but when you look at the UAE and other GCC countries, for those that practice elsewhere, you look here, you're looking at recoveries of sort of 20%, with um, the, the cost of the estate of being you know, up to 10%, with the recoveries and perhaps the most startling taking several years. Okay. Albeit, you know, you have to say, given what we've just been saying about how infrequently this happens, perhaps they're swayed by statistics. But it is clear to see that there's a lot of efficiency that can be brought to the process. Okay. We've talked about financial institutions. I'm not going to talk about that anymore because largely there's a big gap in the law. It's almost like there was a piece of legislation in there and they decided it was too hard to pass, the, pass this law in October if they included it. They'll take it all out and I'll do it at a later stage. Okay? The legislative equivalent of kicking the can down the road. Okay, so we'll see what happens then. Suspect periods, obviously very, very important for those creditors who are raising, uh, who are um, providing finance in the twi what called the twilight zone when there is, there are question marks over the financial soundness. Essentially, it, the law doesn't change it too fundamentally. And for those of you that are familiar with the concept, we'll see in that list of one to five, actually the language there is the same as in the, in the old law. Effectively, it works the same as um, concepts of transactions that are a value or a preference, if you're familiar with those. But now, instead of having this movable feast of up to two years, what suspect periods now look at is two years look back from the, pro um, from the commencement of, um, of the processes under the new law. The court can determine whether or not they are void, so they become now voidable, which is really important because the old law seemed to suggest that they were void full stop, even if that operated to the prejudice of innocent third parties. Okay? So we've got this certainty of two years, rather than this movable feast, and also the, um, the uh, well, what, what Salam always calls the sunshine, the sunshine uh, defence. So, uh, or those of us that are common lawyers would say, equity's darling, the bona fide um, purchaser for value without notice. We'll learn that at law school. There's also a new generic suspect transaction, which is if you knew something, if there was a problem and you really knew, they can look back as far as they like. Okay? Generally speaking, if you're looking at creditors that are providing goods or providing new money and so on, it's generally wouldn't apply. Okay? But taking security for, um, uh, for existing debts, for instance, in a lending transaction, or where you're not providing real value commensurate with what you're taking out, is likely to be suspect under this um, new situation. So that's an overview of the four main processes. Let's look at briefly at, at some of the other aspects that the new law brings. Okay? Now, as we've talked about, set off, it's one of those things that you might put in the bucket of boring, but it's important. Okay? And it's one of those things that lawyers get quite excited about, especially lawyers in the financial industry, because set off on insolvency and netting is, is absolutely critical for the implementation of derivative transactions and indeed many other um, uh, transactions where uh, the, um, the, the amalgamation of claims at the point of insolvency is absolutely critical. The point here, for those that are unfamiliar with it, is that if you have um, a customer with a, uh, with a bank that has a positive credit balance on the one hand, but has also borrowed money, on the point of insolvency of, the, of that customer, is the bank permitted to set off the balance against the loan? Or is it required to refund the money on the credit balance and simply claim for the loan? And this could make a huge difference 
especially in the context of derivatives, where many, you know, th there could be dozens and dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of claims between various institutions on the derivative transaction. So what's the position under, under local law? Uh, it's, it's unsatisfactory, unfortunately. Um, prior to insolvency, it's all fine, it's all contractual. UAE law recognises freedom of contract, so you can do what you like. Indebtedness incurred after the onset of insolvency effectively ranks behind. Unless, of course, you'll all remember it's a super priority debt in that situation, in which case it goes almost to the top. Now, there's also some provisions around assigned debts, but that's probably not important here. That's just to prevent effectively playing around with debts to try and manipulate a financial position. But what's really interesting is, is set up mandatory on, insolven on insolvency? Or even, is it permitted? Now, in many jurisdictions, for instance, in, in, in the UK and elsewhere, set off on insolvency, on the point of insolvency, is mandatory. It's not that it's permitted, it's absolutely mandatory. In the UAE, historically, it's, the law has been slightly unclear in that it said, you can set off on the point of insolvency, provided that the debts are connected. Okay? And unfortunately, it was never clear what connection really means. And it's still not clear 40 odd years on. Now, this difficulty arises, again, sorry, I'm going back to derivatives. I'm not actually a derivative lawyer, but it's a usual example of where, with a derivative, the view was taken that if you had an FX trade on the one hand, and an interest rate, rate trade on the other. The two-way payments that operate, say, within the FX trade on the one hand, or the two-way payments that operated on the uh, interest rate hedge on the other, okay, you could net off those within the trade, but you could not net cross-trade. Yeah? And that was a big, big problem, and it remains a big problem in the, in the derivatives industry. Now, the law, unfortunately, decides to deal with this in one sentence and it's horribly ambiguous. It would appear that set off on insolvency is now permitted, but it's not 100% clear. It's really unfortunate. However, there is a light on the horizon in that we hope that the new letting and, and uh, set off law um, will, will be coming shortly. And if you'd have asked me what shortly meant 12 months ago, I'd have said, you know, no more than five or six years. However, the, um, um, the Executive Council is churning out these new laws at a real rate, so hopefully we'll get something this year on that, which will be really important. For those of you who are involved in financing, subordination is really, really important. Many of you will know. Um, many jurisdictions suffer with this. Can a party agree to subordination? Or does that offend against mandatory principles of pari passi treatment on an insolvency? Can I agree to subordinate my claim such that on insolvency of an entity, I will not prove? And that raises various policy problems because actually when I agree to that, that's fine. And you might say, well, you can agree what you like. I also have my own creditors. And the law introduces a policy behind that to say whether or not you can do it. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, the law doesn't deal with it. So I've told you what the problem is. But I don't have a solution for it yet. Perhaps it will deal with it in the next one. So, what else does the law do? I mentioned three pillars to the new law. I think one of the new pillars that are absolutely critical will be new director's liability and the concept of shadow directorship. Gone are the days, one hopes, where directors can effectively run a business <coughs> with impunity without taking into account the interests of creditors. Now, nobody wants to be in an environment where, cre where directors of a business are too scared to take bold action to rehabilitate a company, to trade through the twilight zone, if that's what its intentions be. Nobody will want that. That doesn't help. And indeed, as we talked about before, I'll come on to again, the criminalisation of, of checks has resulted in directors and other people involved in businesses 
Um, skipping, I understand, is the term. Leaving the country rather than face criminal action. Okay? But this, we don't want to go so far that directors end up in jail simply for trying to save a business. You know, so, but it's clear that directors have been able to act with impunity in the way that they've operated distressed businesses without fear that they may find themselves in trouble. So there are real, there are real liabilities in terms of fines and, and, uh, and indeed uh, jail time if, if you, uh, for, for real mal malfeasance. You can't avoid it simply by not being a director. Okay? If you act like a director, if you act like a manager of the business, then you will be treated like a director of the business. The concept of shadow directorship, and I'm sure you're all familiar with. There's a stay on dishonoured checks. Um, again, it's probably the. Actually, I don't know how many legs on the stool I'm up to now, but that's definitely another one. Um, the, the stay on criminal proceedings, the decriminalisation of debtors, um, you know, is, I think, in the, in the eyes of most people, long overdue here in the UAE. It encourages people to leave at the earliest sign of warning. Yeah, um, it is no, uh, you know, the, the, the old Victorian debtors prisons uh, and so on. You know, there's a reason why most jurisdictions have moved away from that in order to move into uh, the free into a into uh, an economy that encourages the free flow of capital, which must in turn allow the failure of businesses. Unfortunately, for those of you that have a legal bent, um, there is no recognition for cross-border insolvency. So there is a concept of uh, in the, uh, the classic cases, the UNSA trial uh, convention on the recognition of cross-border insolvencies. So if you have an insolvency of, uh, an, um, let's say, an, uh, it, let's, let's say you've got an Indian entity with a branch here in the UAE or, or vice versa, um, what would be ideal if they're in distress is actually to have one lead insolvency process and one that effectively is the slave process and they are coordinated to allow fair treatment of all participants across both jurisdictions. There is no cross-border recognition here in the UAE, which is a real shame, but it is consistent with the way that the UAE legal system operates uh, more, more, more generally. As we learned on the previous talk, there is the invalidation of um, invalidation of provisions that provide for the early termination of contracts or the acceleration of debt. Okay, on the commencement of insolvency process. Now it's easy to look at that if you're a bank and say, well, what does that really mean in that situation? Does it mean that I can't accelerate and so on? Actually, what these generally mean is that you have uh, a, a competition between the draftsman. And the, uh, of the contracts and the draftsman of the legislation. Actually, what it says is on, on the commencement of the insolvency proceedings, but it doesn't say insolvency. So, as long as your event of default says insolvency rather than commencement of insolvency proceedings, you should be fine. And then the final point on there, on there is for complicated corporate groups, the joining of various. Um, um, of various um, uh, groups within uh, various companies within a wider group, if it finds itself distressed, it can all be brought together. So, an evaluation, you know, will it will it work? Well, it's been it's clear that what we're talking about here is evolution rather than revolution. But it, the law introduces some really fundamental changes. Okay. Liabilities for directors, an expedited timeline. A workable cram down mechanism, super priority debt, decriminalisation of checks. So the future looks rosy, but what would it really depend upon? Well, we've learned throughout the whole process <coughs> is supervised by the court. You can't move for getting the court, uh, court approval. The courts in the UAE are perhaps not as dynamic as they are elsewhere in the world. It is a shame many people's eyes that we didn't have a new bankruptcy court established yeah that was familiar with the concepts and could do very quickly okay we don't have that so the role of the court will be really important
important, and most importantly in my mind, whether or not it embraces the spirit of le the legislation and the expedited timelines. If the court decides to disregard those timelines, there's probably not a lot of benefit in the new law. Okay, it needs to be swift, and it needs to be um, uh, it needs to be implemented with, in accordance with the spirit as well as the letter. I also mentioned the role of the insolvency official that has a central role in the rehabilitation process. Okay, he produces the rehabilitation plan. He reports on progress against that rehabilitation um, plan. He may, he may well even have control of that business. And the identity of that person is going to be absolutely critical for the success of any individual implementation. Now, historically, this concept has been used in the courts through the appointment of experts. And those of you that are involved in UAE legislation will be familiar with the role of experts. And it's probably fair to say that anyone that's had involvement in, say, two cases involving experts will have had mixed experience with it. But what we're seeing in this legislation is a move away from the court list of experts. And they are now the court is now permitted to appoint off list, which might not seem very, very important. But what's, you know, what's, what's critical here is we're moving away from the, you know, potentially the locally connected guy that perhaps isn't as experienced as others to, to many um, you know, fully qualified accountancy firms and solvency officials which you know, many of you will be, will be a party to. And therefore, the appointment of that official is absolutely, absolutely critical uh, and will have a central role. So, comparison, new and old, well, I won't go through it around that because actually if you go around it, you'll actually see that all those headings, if you like, still appear in the new law. But one would hope that with the incremental benefits to each of those that I've outlined, that actually we do have reason to be optimistic, albeit perhaps only cautiously so. Thank you for your patience. Repeat that, I couldn't hear you with the noise. How does up. local shareholders' rights get impacted? How will they, the local shareholders local get impacted? Local shareholder who is holding 51%. Well, the new law doesn't distinguish by reason of nationality. So there is no difference between a local shareholder, if you like, and an international shareholder in that regard. Um, it's subject to the court. So if you have a dim view of the courts, then it will be subject to that dim view. But the, the law makes no dis doesn't distinguish at all between the nationality of the shareholders. And if you go back to right at the very start, where he said that one of the problems with the old law is that it affected a value transfer between debt and equity, many of the new provisions in the new law, to my mind, go some way to redressing that balance. And therefore, it recognises to a far greater degree the primacy of creditors over debtors and, by implication, the shareholders. See, in case of uh, insolvent liquidation, it can happen because of two reasons, amongst others. The business becomes totally unviable, and there is uh, malfeasance on the part of the company or, its, uh, or the debtor, for that matter. Yeah. At the same time, the petition can be brought in by the debtor himself. Is it not contradictory? That's number one. Number two, in case of malfeasance actions by the debtor, which might also tantamount to breach of the covenants which he may have signed with the debtor, rather the creditor, the bankers, how does the law accommodate such a situation? Okay. Um, my wife tells me I can only think about one thing at a time, so I'll, I'll try and deal with them. I'll try and remember the second one while I'm answering the first one. But in short, um, the, the debtor 
it may well find itself in a position where uh, um, it might want to file for an insolvent liquidation because it forms a view, the directors form the view, that the business is no longer a donning concern. And in order to discharge the director's duties that it has to the company, it may well file for insolvency. So, yeah, I can see why you say that it's inconsistent, but I'm not sure that it is. But even to the extent to which it is, it's only an option. It's not only the debtor that can file. It can, it can, be, it can be anyone that, 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 that can file. And I've just lived up to my wife's expectation and forgotten the second question. Sorry, can I, uh, can you, could you repeat the second question? The second question is, if there is a malfeasance uh, by oh, the debtor, yes. is the debtor also subject to criminal actions by the court? Uh, for such actions? Well, the, it would be, I mean, yes, in short, yes. I mean, uh, um, I don't have time to go into what malfeasance means in this situation. But yes, the individuals involved in the malfeasance could find themselves at the wrong end of a criminal suit and therefore getting fines or even spend some time in jail. Good evening. Thank you for that excellent presentation. Uh, my question is about a foreign entity. Often you have uh, foreign entities, for example, BVI or etc. within 
the three or the five years plus the extension period. If it doesn't and it fails, comes. We do need, uh, yeah, I have a simple question. Uh, if a person has uh, more than one business and in one of the business, uh, one of the creditor files for insolvency, so how would you affect the other business of that person when he is in partner with other uh, people? Okay, well if they're in companies, obviously this is done on a company by company basis. If it's an individual, then uh, uh, it, you end up in this, so if you have like a, uh, like a proprietorship or establishment as they used to be called, and uh, that person who immediately runs those businesses, it is hard, if not impossible, to see how they can be distinguished because the liabilities of the establishment or the proprietorship are the liabilities of the individual. And therefore, if you've got two establishments, they must be one and the same. Now, the law doesn't deal with that position, but that must be implicit, otherwise the law doesn't make sense in that situation. But as you know, the way that the debtor gets around that is to organise itself through the use of different companies with different assets and different liabilities for the two or several different enterprises. Uh, good evening. If the cheque is uh, bounced and cheques is signed apart by the owner, by the employee, which the finance controller, then the legal implication is only against the owner or against all the signatories? I think it's usually regarded by the drawer of the cheque. There seems to be a lot of interest with checks around here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. it, it, it's usually the drawer of the checks, so it's a personal liability. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Christian Saunders, for the very wonderful presentation. It generated a lot of interest. I'm sure a lot of people are interested in that, but by this so far, I think no, no one should be affected by this. To propose a vote of thanks, may I request our treasurer, CM Mahmood Pongara, on this stage.
quite specific to the provision and this is one piece of legislation that is the uh, where legal process and the financial process subverges when we speak about insolvency on the flip side of it it is about money cash flow and draw so we as professionals got really benefited and it has been a great analytical session and we dubai chapter Institutional partner, Delhi Private School, our platinum sponsors, Lulu Supermarket, Petro Market, and Department Stores, Commercial Bank of Dubai, Manabar Gold and Diamonds, Pipco, Media Partner, Kelly Stars, Branding Partner, Adventure, and for Ad Agency for this venue, and for the delicious food they have been serving and beautifully serving also. See, most importantly, gentlemen, to our valued members, our sponsors, guests, You came in large number. You showed extreme interest. You defined the day. Smart questions and curious learning. More importantly, your presence was quite spectacular. Thank you all for your valuable presence. Thank you all. <laughs> Now it is the please one minute. It is the time to give a momento to our distinguished speaker. May I please call upon. Secretary Anish Mehta to present the memento to our speaker, Mr. Christian Sander, and our senior vice chairman, Secretary of Industry, Anish Mehta. Thank you. 